Thank you, worship team. Good morning. How's everybody doing? To the three of you awake, I'm glad you are here. All right. Let's try this again. Good morning. morning. There we go. Well, I'm excited to be with you this morning as we uh, close our 12th year journey through the book of Acts. Um, We started this... I can't even remember how long. There weren't certain children who are here now, weren't here when we started. Um, It's been a journey, but it's been a good journey. And so uh, this morning, as we're kind of wrapping up the book of Acts, I want to do my best to briefly land the ship, I guess, um, because we've been on boat rides the last couple weeks. And so I I just want to kind of start from the beginning and then jump right to the end Uh, Because we do see a really cool picture. And so I'm just going to start in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So this is right after the resurrection of Jesus. He is with his disciples, the apostles. And it says this, When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? Okay, God, it's, it's really cool. You've done all these miracles. You came back from, from, from being dead. That is amazing. So is now the time that you're going to free us and give us our kingdom? And Jesus replies, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into the cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them, saying, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday will return from heaven the same way that he came. And so we started this journey with this mandate from Jesus, right? It was in response to, so now you're going to do what we want, right? You did your thing. You conquered sin and death. Awesome. So now you're going to give us our kingdom, get these oppressors out of here, make our life easy, put us in charge. That's, that's now, right? You did all your things. Now it's our time. It's our time now. Down here, it's our time. And Jesus goes, rightfully goes, hey, so no, but you're going to receive the Holy Spirit and then you will become my witnesses. You're going to tell everybody everywhere about me. It's pretty awesome. And then he like up into heaven and he's gone. And so we see this mandate from Jesus. This is not about us. Our kingdom here, this is about his kingdom. No, I'm not establishing your kingdom. I'm not setting you free from whatever you think is oppressing you. I'm showing you this is how you're going to live for my kingdom. You're going to be filled with the spirit and you're going to go. And you're going to tell people about me wherever you go. And so we see this mandate from Jesus. And then we see the church's response in Acts 2. And this is one that we all love to have, you know, like the Thomas Kincaid photos of. And it's all beautiful and whatever. And that other dude with the, like, sparkling lights in his paintings. Who's who's that guy? Is that the same guy? Same guy, yeah. And so we're like, oh, it's so beautiful. Look at that beautiful picture of the church. All the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to sharing in, the, in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And because they were doing this, all of these things were happening. A deep sense of awe came over all of them. The apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, shared the money with those in need. They worshiped to God Uh, Together at the temple each day, they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord added to their fellowship uh, those who were being saved. 
And so we see this mandate from Jesus that you're going to be filled with the Spirit and you're going to go and share about uh, me with everyone. And then we see the church's response. They did it together. They devoted themselves to the Lord's teaching, to being with each other, to sharing meals. They spent so much time together. And God was doing amazing things in them and through them as they were learning to live out his kingdom on earth. God was adding people. And then we see that persecution started coming. And hardship came. People started now being thrown in jail and being stoned to death because of their faith in Jesus and following the way of Jesus and his kingdom. And so we see persecution come. But in the same time, we're seeing blessings come and miracles come. And so this is something that does not compute with us because when we experience hardships or persecution, we go, well, where's God gone? What has happened? What have I done wrong? What do I need to fix? But we see in scripture when persecution came that the church, it started thriving even more. It expanded. It started following Jesus's mandate as they were pushed out of Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the world. We see that blessing and persecution and hardship and God at work are all together in this. And for us, it sometimes doesn't compute because we're told you want to bless life, you should have no issues in your life. Your life should be great. It should be easy. And that's a sign of God's blessing or favor on you. And that's not what we see in the beginning of the church. But yet the church is thriving. It's vibrant. It's beautiful. People are following the way of Jesus and his kingdom and seeing lives transformed. And then as we continue, the shift and focus of the, the journey through the book of Acts has been the uh, apostles and disciples and them spreading out. And then we get hyper-focused on one man's conversion, Saul's conversion, Saul to Paul. Saul was an amazing religious leader. He could do things with the word of God that others couldn't. He knew it through and through, and he could teach and debate and educate and correct. He was amazing at this, yet he was opposing the way of Jesus. And a matter of fact, remember, he was on his way to go and persecute more, and he met Jesus. And we see a conversion take place, and we see a new life being birthed. It's no longer Saul, it is Paul, and there's transformation in this conversion. And then he starts walking out what it looks like for him to be faithful to the call of God, to go and be a witness. And so we've journeyed with Paul for the last several months, a couple of different boat rides, and that's kind of where we're ending um, this journey. He is on a boat, and we're going to pick it up in verse... 11, I believe. And so it says this, 28, uh, chapter 28, verse 11. It says it was three months after the shipwreck. Remember, he shipwrecked, uh, and then they um, were bit, he was bit by a snake, and uh, he shook it off. I'm glad Norm didn't reference Taylor Swift once in that message. And then, um, and then I remember, like, I can't remember. It must be in a different translation, but uh, then Paul said, hey, whenever you gather... Um, also, grab snakes so that you can prove that the Lord is with you. Um, I think that's somewhere, right? Is that different translation? Book of Okay. Yeah, it's one of those lost books that we don't have, but uh, don't play with snakes. Um, and so after three months of being shipwrecked, uh, they set sail um, from, uh, with another ship that wintered there on the island, and let's see, they had twin, twin gods and figureheads. Their first stop was Syracuse, where they stayed for three days. From there, they sailed to uh, the port of R, and then they drove. A uh, day later, a south wind began blowing, and uh, the following day, they went up to the coast of P Town. There, they found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so uh, we came to Rome. Then the brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us. Uh, at the Forum of uh, Appian Way. Others joined us at the Three Taverns. 
See, so we're, we were journeying through as a church, and we stopped off at the Bellwether Tavern. We were just trying to be biblical. That's why we met in the tavern there, just following. And Okay. Uh, when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. When he arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was being guarded by a soldier. So this is kind of fun, right? He's on a boat trip. We see him journey again. We see all this stuff. And then he finally gets to a place, and he's permitted to have his own space. Though he's still a prisoner, still in chains, he has his own place. And the first thing he does, it says, three days later, after Paul's arrival, he called together all of the Jewish leaders. He said to them, brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government even though I had done nothing wrong against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested to this decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. So I've asked you to come here today so we can get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, well, we have had no letters from Judea or other reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe. For the only thing that we know about this movement is it is denounced everywhere. So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging, He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the book of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. I'm going to pause there. So I love this picture. Paul has done nothing wrong against the customs. He's been tried. He's already gone through his thing. And so he's appealed to Caesar, and he's come to this place. He's endured shipwreck. He's endured um, threats against his life, all of these things. He finally gets to Rome. He does have a little bit of freedom. They allow him to pay for his own place, and he's still guarded. So he's not free, but he's got a little bit of space, which is great. And the first thing he does is he goes to the religious people. And he wants to share with them the hope that he has found in Jesus. He wants to help connect the dots. Hey, that Messiah that we've been longing for, that we've been praying for, that we've been waiting for, it's Jesus. And he goes to the scriptures, which would be our Old Testament, and he's proclaiming and connecting the dots going, this is, when they spoke about this, that is Jesus that they were pointing to. He is this. He is this. He's connecting all of the dots. And what I love about this example is that Paul could have been pretty defeated. The circumstances of his life since saying yes to Jesus have not been what maybe you or I would say is great. He's been stoned to death dragging outside of the city gates. He's been shipwrecked. He has been accused of turning his back on God from his other, his old religious friends. His life has not been ideal, that you and I would say. But yet, in this moment, his heart is set for the kingdom of God. And he has used his whole life. He's used his skills his abilities, his talents, the good circumstances, the bad circumstances, being imprisoned in probably the center of the known world in Rome, he leveraged all of those things to point people to Jesus. And he was having Bible studies while he's in prison, inviting people, trying to share hope with them. 
And what I, I see about Paul is he was not focused on his circumstances, the good or the bad. He was focused on the kingdom of God and on the king that has commissioned him to go. And so it continues. Well, actually, I'll pause here. How do we know this? How do we know, how do we know that Michael's just not making stuff up? Because in Philippians, he says this to the church. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped spread the good news. Everything that has happened. You mean being shipwrecked? Being beaten? All of it. Everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here gained confidence to boldly speak God's messages without fear. Because Paul was being faithful in the middle of the circumstances that he was in, because he was being faithful, others were encouraged by his faithfulness and able to walk out what God has asked them to walk out. Paul encourages the Ephesian church he says this, he says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece, that he has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do all the good things he has planned for us long ago. Paul is encouraging us by his life. We've spent so much of the last several months looking at this one man's journey of being faithful witness to Jesus. His life is not prescriptive in that you need to go be a tent maker and go find yourself uh, incarcerated so that you could preach the message. But which, what it is prescriptive of is figuring out who God has called you to be and leveraging everything that he has made you to be for pointing people to Jesus. All of us. You have gifts, you have talents, you have abilities, you have pasts. Paul leveraged his past. How many of his testimonies were, I was this guy. I did bad things. And because I met Jesus, he has transformed me and now I'm walking out this way. So there is hope for you if you are stuck in this thing, or if your past brings you shame, Jesus forgives you and then calls you into more and to better into this new life. And so for us, we see this example that Paul is telling us when Jesus commissioned the early disciples and apostles to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to go and to be a witness it's not for the special elect. It's not for those with a microphone. It's for each and every one of us. And Paul paints the picture that you are a masterpiece. God didn't make a mistake when he made you. Now, our journey with Jesus is to figure out what does that look like to walk in the fullness of how he's created you, to use your gifts, your talents, your abilities. There's so many of us in this room that that are great witnesses for Christ. But maybe some of us are ashamed of where we were before. Like there are people in here who have had hard lives growing up. And thank God he has saved you and redeemed you and brought you out of that and has set you uh, as his son or daughter and is calling you into what's next. There are others who are stuck right now in what you used to be stuck in. That God has positioned you to be a witness. To bring hope to the hopeless. To encourage those who need to be encouraged. And this is what it looks like. No matter the circumstances, good, bad, indifferent, you were there for a reason. Wherever you are. Well, I'm just... Uh, Stay-at-home mom. Awesome. 
how can you be a faithful witness to Christ in your world using the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given you? And maybe, I'm not prescribing, but maybe there are others who are like you that need to see what it looks like to have hope in Jesus and walk that out as a stay-at-home mom or an IT professional. Well, God's not in the IT professional world. We're a whole bunch of ones and zeros. Yes, and God loves ones and zeros. Right? Again, it's a matter of perspective. We think, or I think, I won't put it on you, even though I've had conversations with you, many of you, and I won't name you out, single you out, but like, how could God use me? I am just fill in the blank. Or I've done and so he can't. We've just spent like nine months looking at Paul's life. Have any of you murdered people? Don't raise your hand if you have. Because I, I think I'm a, I can't remember what Washington, yeah, I can't remember what, it's so, yeah, blurry what I need to report in Washington State. But my conscience, right? We all have things we're not proud of. But when we, Surrender. We devote ourselves to God and, and to each other and to his kingdom first. God transforms us, and he uses those things in our past, in our present, to shape the future, to bring others into the fold. It's God that adds people. And how does he do that? By using us as witnesses. And uh, Brandon says it a lot, but I think he stole it from some old uh, uh, Francis of Assisi, like, Preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words, right? It's how you live your life. It's how, it's how does your life point people to Jesus in the good and the bad. Paul's life screams that God is good because we've just journeyed through his life, and many of us would never sign up for that life. But we know that God was with him. And he was blessed. And so he's preaching, he's sharing, he's reasoning with them. And in verse 28, it says this, Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. After they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. So some heard Paul's reasoning where Paul was showing them the Messiah, Jesus, has come. Some believed, others did not. And so Paul shares this. He says, the Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, go and say this to this people. When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and their eyes cannot. And they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see. And their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. And so he continues to say, So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. And so for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense, he welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. So we see kind of the closing of this, this story. We see Paul declaring the truth, pleading with people, debating with people, so that they would taste and see what he's experienced, the Messiah the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Some respond, others do not. He quotes the um, Isaiah, which Jesus also quoted in Matthew 13 when he was talking with people. And it's hard. Paul loves these people. He didn't want to divide. He wanted all of his brothers and sisters to come to know Jesus. He wasn't playing a gotcha game or a, well, good, I'm better than you. He really passionately cared for these brothers and sisters. He wanted them to experience the living Christ. 
the the Greek word for when it says they, their hearts were hardened, in the Greek it literally means fat. Their hearts were fattened. Have any of you ever had or known somebody who had fat accumulation around their heart? It's hard for that heart to be beating because it's so constricted. And so he's telling these people, your hearts are fat. They're surrounded with fatty tissue. It's con constructing. It's constricting and, const and, and, and hurting your ability to respond to Jesus. And for the Jewish people, they would have understood this analogy because they didn't have butcher shops. Most of the Jewish people trimmed their own meat. And so this idea of your hearts are fat, and that's why you can't respond to God, they would understand you cut away the fat. And Paul is, is trying to convince these people. And it really resonates with us because I was sharing with some other people um, this earlier this week and What do you think Paul's message would be to the church? What do you think Jesus' message would be to the church? And how do you think we would respond if Jesus was here and goes, hey, I want you to be filled with the Spirit and live as my witnesses, and you respond with, I show up to church most weekends. I sometimes give. I'll serve if I'm forced to. I sometimes, you know, what would his response be? Man, your hearts are fattened. You have ears, but you're not hearing. You have eyes, but you're not seeing. And so for my question, as we kind of go to groups, is how is our hearts, are our hearts open to what the, the Lord wants to speak to us today? Are we open to discovering what it means for us to live as witnesses for Christ? Our hearts soft, that if God is lovingly correcting you or redirecting your paths, are you willing to respond with obedience, with humility? Or do you have this life figured out? You've got Jesus. You said yes to him. You've invited him into your heart. How is our hearts? Are we hungry for him? Are we hungry for the king and his kingdom? Or do we have some blinders on that his kingdom means this? And when Jesus goes, my kingdom is actually this, we miss it. And so I want us to wrestle. Are you living out your masterpiece mission? Paul's was a great example. But there are great examples in this room. Norm was sharing with me a couple weeks ago. He encouraged the young people. They said, well, we're just students. Yeah, and you can point people to Jesus with how you love and live your life. And that was radical for them. How are you loving and leading people to Jesus by the way you live your life? Do you have hope? Because God's calling us to be witnesses. And so I want us to wrestle this out because the book of Acts doesn't end in chapter 28. It's more of a jumping off point. Jesus wants to write Acts 29 through each and every one of our lives. How is that story going to play out? Are you going to trust him? in the good circumstances, the bad circumstances, the ups, the downs? Are you going to trust him and follow him and learn what it looks like to, to live out who you are in him? So let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you that, that you loved us enough to intervene into our lives, that you've called us your sons and daughters. You've made a way for us to say yes to you, to follow your way in your kingdom, God. And so I pray that as we wrestle out 
um, kind of the, the closing of this chapter and the beginning of what's ahead. God, I pray that you would um, bring clarity, that you'd bring hope, that you'd bring direction, that you'd bring encouragement to each of our hearts, God, that you would remind us that we are, are your masterpiece, that you've created us on purpose, with a purpose. And so, God, I just pray that you'd be glorified as we wrestle out what it looks like to follow you, to love you, to love those in our lives. And so we just give you this time, pray that you would move. In Jesus' name, amen.